and we are now live on YouTube. Hello, everyone. So welcome to ESMA Conference 2023 and this panel dis uh, discussion seven, uh, the role of rapid reviews in our evidence analysis ecosystems. Um, this workshop is being live streamed to YouTube. Um, welcome to all of you. Uh, if you have any questions for our presentations, presentators, I can't speak, uh, you can ask them via the ES Hackathon Twitter account by commenting on the tweet about this workshop. You can also ask questions via the live YouTube stream, or you can comment and chat with other participants on the dedicated Slack channel. Uh, which we've been sent uh, the link to with your registration information. We'll try and answer all your questions as we can uh, live, but uh, it might take us some time to get through them all. Um, finally, we'd like to just draw your attention to our code of conduct, which is available on, on the ESMACOMP website at www.esmaconf.org. Um, and I've, I've been uh, moderating a lot of these, these discussions this week, uh, but my name is Matt Granger, um, a researcher at the uh, Norwegian Institute for Nature Research, Nina in Trondheim, in Norway. Um, so I, I'm going to ask the, the panel uh, the first question and get them to introduce themselves. So um, the question is going to be, yeah, what is it that we, we mean when we talk about rapid reviews? So how do we define that? So please introduce yourself and then, then tell us the answer to that question. Um, Arjun, do you want to take us take us away? Absolutely. So hello, Mar. Hi, everyone. So I'm Arjun Veroniki. I'm a scientist at St. Michael's Hospital in, and based in Toronto in Canada. I'm also an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. And it's a pleasure to be today here and discuss about the rapid reviews, which is really a hot topic nowadays, I would say. Um, so what do we mean when we say rapid review is actually a knowledge synthesis review, um, which uh, it's a systematic review, let's say, um, where some steps um, are omitted or modified, we could say that um, in order to produce evidence um, to decision makers um, in a more resource and time efficient manner, if I can say that. Um, and really, since the, the start of COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen an increase in those um, uh, publication of the rapid reviews. Um, and that's mainly uh, because of the time. Uh, we always need um, more time efficient uh, products. So a systematic review might take, um, let's say, one to two years, 12 to 24 months to be conducted, whereas a, a, a rapid review um, using these streamlined processes, so, um, it can be conducted within five to 12 weeks uh, to complete. And also an important um, item here is that we can reduce the cost of conducting such types of reviews. Um, so I'll say in Canadian dollars, this would be around 25,000 uh, Canadian dollars. Um, so it's really uh, also cost effective. So that's what I would actually say that is a rapid review. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt, what do you, what do you think of rapid review, review is? Well, introduce yourself first. Hey, uh, I'm Matt Jones. I'm a postdoc at Exeter, working on um, some systematic review meta-analysis stuff. Um, done a couple of rapid review type projects with the Environment Agency in the UK. Um, yeah, I, I guess part of the reason I'm on this panel is that um, sometimes it's, I, th I think it's hard to define what a rapid review is. Um, uh, as I, I, as you said, um, yeah, it sort of uh, leaves out certain parts of the traditional review, systematic review process in order to make it uh, much more feasible, often in, in working with policymakers or more time sensitive issues. Um, but I guess it's sometimes unclear where the where to draw the line and yeah. And Gav. Hi folks, I'm Gavin Stewart, I'm a scientist at Newcastle University. So I, I think rapid review is actually a bit of an unhelpful term, if I'm honest, because it means everything. So it means nothing. You know, a, a rapid review could be a systematic review that adheres to Cochrane methodological expectations or Campbell methodological expectations. That's on a on a narrowly focused question. That's done really, really well, but with lots of people who really know what they're doing really, really quickly. That's, that's a rapid review. 
Um, it could be something in one domain, but doesn't have any duplicate extraction and doesn't have a critical appraisal. So someone in medicine would say, oh, that was a rapid review. You took lots of dodgy shortcuts. And someone in ecology would turn around and say, what do you mean? That's what I call a systematic review. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's an unhelpful term. And then it gets even worse because, you know, people start talking about ultra rapid reviews on all of this kind of stuff. But, but, but the basic kind of idea is that it's a review that's done with limited resources or in a tight time frame. Um, and if you're going to do one, that's great. You know, we, we've outlined the, the potential advantages of that kind of approach. You know, try to be cost effective. But you've got to make some value judgments about which things you're not going to do. And that carries a risk. You know, if you make good value judgments there, it's fine. You know, I've done loads of reviews where I've done very little searching in non-English languages. I've done reviews with very, you know, if I had an information scientist on the team, they'd say the search was cursory. But I've got nearly all the studies. And let's face it, usually all the studies are crap anyway. So, you know. What you does it matter if you miss a couple of studies? Sometimes it doesn't, you know. So sometimes you can make these value judgments and, and they're justified. Sometimes you make a value judgment like you're not going to have a critical appraisal. That's a big problem for me, even though I see lots of things that are called systematic reviews that just don't do it. So yeah, that's kind of where I am with rapid reviews. I think everyone sort of agrees that there something's done rapidly, and there's some some uh, corners cut, I suppose. But yeah, I, I agree with Gareth really that that um, the sort of stuff that we do, uh, well, I do every day is, is is yeah a rapid review, but just by because I'm uh, an ecologist and we we don't bother with a lot of <laughs> all the stuff we should be doing. So it's important. So we're going to talk about sort of how R can be um, useful within rapid reviews. Um, so let's try and think, I mean, how can, how do you think that R could, could for a start, but then also how can it, um, and what sort of areas do you think uh, R might help uh, in speeding up some of the processes that we're talking about? Um, so Matt, what do you think about that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, I guess, um... It, 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 I mean, there's packages to de help uh, design search terms, for example. So the um, lit search R package um, can be useful for speeding up that process. Um, I, I guess one of the things with these rapid reviews is that I think they often occur in contexts where you might not have a lot of people with R or other R or other coding skills. Um, but I haven't, yeah typically found in those projects that I did use a lot of them. Uh, Argy? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that um, since, uh, as Max and Gavin said, since in a rapid review, our number one priority is to decrease time. So, um, I think R would play a key role here. Um, and maybe if we can you know, uh, introduce machine learning and AI systems here to speed up the processes potentially for um, screening. Screening and data abstraction actually are the steps that the more time consuming steps in a systematic review. So I believe if we had these tools to reduce um, this conduction of screening and data abstraction, re reduce them from months to potentially days, I think that would be a high success. Um, and even for risk of bias, currently I know that there is this um, automated tool, um, the robot reviewer tool um, that assesses these um, steps of um, certain steps, uh, certain items of risk of bias in, in, IRC, in uh, RCTs. Um, and I believe this, uh, this tool has high accuracy. So what this tool does mainly is to, uh, the, the user has to upload the PDF 
the RCT. Um, and so then the tool actually pulls text from the PDF to, to um, derive this bias assessment, uh, some quotes from the manuscript. Um, so this, I believe, is a very helpful tool to reduce those steps, I mean, reduce time in, in, um, in the conduction of the review. Um, but certainly we could um, potentially use um, R to, to appraise the review, the systematic or rapid review, however we want to call it, um, using, for example, Amstar or Robis tools. Those, um, to my knowledge at least, they, they, there is no automated approach still. And um, although we, we know that researchers um, have noted so far that an automated strategy to assess the quality of those reviews would be valuable. Um, so I believe the key question is how we can work together um, to potentially uh, improve the flow of the data from trials to the systematic review, to the visualization even of the data, and in the end provide the, uh, the, the right evidence, the high quality evidence to produce guidelines for best practice. So I believe R would play a key role in the whole process of this um, rapid review. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think that as well. But uh, <laughs> I think um, one of the big issues that uh, I know that uh, we have in, in ecology and conservation is this lack of standardization within publications. So I know in some fields they have very, very good standards about, you know, there's always a, the effect size somewhere in, in, a, in a paper stated, like this is the effect size. Uh, whereas ecology and conservation, we often just, just, write stuff and ignore that thing so i think there's there's some probably we're probably at earlier stage would you agree gav that we're earlier stage yeah i think i think the kind of advantages of ai on the on the screening and appraisal side of things i think they're there now in disciplines where as you say where you've got reporting guidelines like consort and you're talking about rcts where the reporting is done in a kind of fairly standardised way and where, you, where you're doing a big review, you know, because then it's worth training your AI to do all of that if it's big and complicated, and that's going to speed things up. I think where you're doing, if you're doing a rapid review by focusing and having a narrow focus question, at the moment, I'm not sure that R does actually have a great role but I think it has a potential role in the future that's massive, which is which is what's just been outlined. You know, the, the ability to screen is there. The ability to um, think about appraisal is there. Uh, the ability, you could even think about strength of evidence as well, because you could pull your the bits and pieces that you need out of your risk of bias tables and your meta-analysis. All of those things could be semi-automated. Um, and there are elements of that in things like Revman and some of the kind of bits and pieces that, that I've done. Um, so I think all the elements are there, and that's definitely the way the ecosystem is going. If you look at look at the diversity of the products that people are developing and exploring that are being presented this week in this conference, if you start bolting all these things together in an intelligent way, then I think that that potential for semi-automation to really speed things up is there. I, yeah, with this, yeah. It's worth talking about that chat GP side of it as well and the whole AI side of it, because I think we're a million miles off being able to press a button and have a computer do a systematic review for you. And would you want to, I guess? <laughs> and and the, oh, yeah. the, big, the big problem for, for because of that is, you know, these discrepancies between what the words say and what the data says and what the data in the table says and what the data in the figure says, all the stuff that we're all so familiar with as systematic reviewers. Um, and I think that's something that needs articulating, that, that people kind of think evidence synthesis can be automated. I definitely think of it as semi-automated. It's about speeding up the process, doing the same thing the same way, but you're still always going to need a human to look at this stuff. And, and the last thing I'll say before I shut up and give others a chance is the other thing that's going to happen as a result of this is fabrication. Okay, so already, who, who, it depends on your discipline how much of an issue is fabrication of data. 
but it's going to be incredibly easy to make data up. And not only to make data up, to make data up that is internally consistent. So it looks as if it's properly randomized, even if it isn't, even if it's completely made up data. So you won't be able to look for baseline imbalances because you'll just say, make me up a real data set. Um, and so our mechanisms for checking for fabrication are going to need to change radically, I think, over the next kind of 10 years. So that's something. Those two things will go hand in hand, I think. We will start sticking these elements together to get decent automated systems for, for, for thinking about evidence synthesis. But they'll have to evolve to some of these other challenges that at the moment aren't really a problem. Yeah, I, I would sort of come in. I don't think the major issues facing record reviews are really to do with that either. I think uh, from my experience, what I've faced is it's just basic stuff about study, how to design your review, asking really broad, too many questions, which especially when working with policymakers um, and often are can get in the way, especially if you're working <laughs> with a team who doesn't, is doesn't use that as their go-to software or doesn't have any coding experience. Um, it can actually slow things down, which is why sometimes I use non-R tools um, with more of a graphic user interface, like for screening and, well, it's just, it's just stuff like web-based things. Um, and, you know, as much as I like our Shiny, I guess sometimes the performance isn't there to, to at, at present to handle, to, it just doesn't compare to, other web-based tools. And if I can also add here, um, so I, I certainly agree with uh, what all that have been said so far. So um, I believe that chat DBD and all these AI tools, all these technologies should be used, um, applied with a human oversight, right, and control. So we, we should not skip the, the key researcher tasks, if I can say that, um, where we actually use those, I mean, tools to, to uh, help us. And uh, the, the researcher should always be responsible for the interpretation of the results, for drawing those conclusions. We shouldn't really rely on those technologies. So, and when we use them, we have always, we always need to be transparent and disclose this in, in, in a manuscript and or in a report that we produce. So I certainly agree with all that has been stated. Yeah, I think with us, one go. I was going to say one one bit that I think it probably could help with sooner rather than later is to kind of multiplicity issues, which I'm not sure how much you've been talking about them this year. You know, but you know that problem where you know you've got 56 treatments and you've got. Um, five different populations and you've got um, high and low risk of bias and your outcomes been measured in two different ways and suddenly before you know it you've got you know 5,856 analyses to run and you know people talk about trying to kind of do the meta averaging or the Bayesian model averaging across all of that and all of those kinds of things and I can see how as part of a kind of living review type ideas, some of these bits of software, like threshold analysis, network meta analysis, that lets you kind of look across the, all of that all in one go, or the way that you could kind of loop through all of those analyses in R, it would let you do something really, really complicated that, that could then feed into a decision model of some kind. I've never seen it done, but the potential to do that, I think, is there. But I'd kind of see that. I'm not sure I'd call that a rapid review. That's kind of doing the next mad, mega complicated review in a kind of that, that isn't feasible at the moment, but but might be feasible. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, this sort of a distinction between rapid reviews and speeding up systematic reviews in a way like. Yeah. And. Does one undermine the other? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost a way of pulling together multiple systematic reviews to actually answer a question. 
You know how, you know, even when you've got a big systematic review looking at multiple outcomes and all the rest of it, it's usually only one element of the whole system, isn't it? But you could potentially start sticking everything together. And I, I think I think R is very exciting in that way. Absolutely. And if I can also add here, um, <clears throat> so we have, uh, as you said, we may also have multiple systematic reviews addressing, addressing the same topic, the same specific topic. And uh, currently from our team, Dr. Lani is leading um, a project on uh, identifying the most valid systematic reviews um, that address a specific topic um, so that this specific systematic review is most rigorous um, and um, with high quality. Uh, she calls this uh, tool wisest. And so she plans to use R and potentially AI tools to try to make this um, selection of the highest quality systematic review more efficient. So that would be, I believe, very, very important um, um, to be able to identify the, the most valid systematic review for a specific topic that we may want to make a decision. So um, I'll just think on, on the terms of the chat GBT type of, of things. I've just got to say that, that I know that Kate Neo is, is drinking every time we mention chat GTP at the conference. So I'm going to mention it a few more times just to, to get a drinking away. But I think I, I agree that, the, that we're too far away from that, really. And we can't really trust that yet to be transparent enough to, to give us, uh, um, yeah. We, I think the systematic reviewing and providing it, the, the whole process is trying to be as, as rigorous and um, transparent as possible. And I think then relying on a black box is really going to, um, yeah, throw that throw a span in the works. I know we rely on black boxes a lot, but that's that's one one of the problems. We had a really interesting question or well, comment from um, Trevor Trevor Riley. Um, he suggests maybe that we're closer to realizing a rapid systematic map uh, than we are for a rapid systematic review using our tools. So, uh, just what, what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'd agree. Yeah. If you thought about, if you kind of, if you did a systematic map and you sat all that stuff in Shiny, then, you know, you, 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 you kind of, it is like a living systematic map then, isn't it? And you could even, you can have the ability to change the scope and all the rest of it. In fact, do you not already have a tool a little bit like that? Does Neil not develop something a little bit like that for displaying systematic map? data that's a lot easier isn't it than, than generating effect sizes and appraising effect sizes and synthesizing evidence um so i think yeah you're much closer with a systematic map yeah but who wants a systematic map any other comments matt um uh, yeah I, I guess um I guess, yeah, when, you know, thinking about R generally, one of the criticisms of the availability of so many statistical tools is that, you know, people don't actually sit, like like by, by the old school, is that people don't actually sit down and try to understand what's going on underneath the, the bonnet kind of thing. So I, I guess there's that to bear in mind. Um, I, yeah. I don't know if anyone's used like chat GPT to... Uh, Design. Sorry, I'm just I'm getting in on the game here. But um, to, to design search terms. Um, but I, yeah, I do think that. Yeah, I think that would create an interesting relationship with your information specialist, who is the useful in a lot of other senses as 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 well, and and is a big collaborator on the project for me. So I. Yeah, I think I think this is something I think generally with system review you have to. Think of the implications of automation as well more broadly. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things we have talked about in the past is uh, in ES Hackathon and, and EsmaConf is this sort of chaining tools together. So starting off with uh, LitSearcher, um, chaining that to something else to, um, yeah, uh, Ending up in Evi Atlas, which is the, the tool you're thinking about, Gav, um, for systematic mapping. Um, 
studies. So just uh, yeah, trying to chain things together into, into workflows that are transparent and repeatable. Uh, using GitHub to, to store all the information and to share that in, in certain ways. So you can end up with that sort of, yeah, living systematic review type of um, system way map type of approach. I think it's something where sort of, I don't know if it's ever been stated anywhere, but I think it's that sort of approach we're thinking in terms, terms of. Yeah, and it's, you know, it ties in really nicely with all of the open science practice, doesn't it, as well, you know, in terms of repeatability, transparency, someone wants to use it in a slightly different context they can take it off and change the population uh you know or someone wants to update it well you can so yeah going back to what matt was saying about you know folk criticizing the black box end of this kind of thing that to some extent it might be a valid criticism but that criticism's always been there when the then when the simonian and laird put their random effects meta-analysis method into an excel spreadsheet people said oh my gosh this is the end of the world uh the barbarians are at the gates anyone can do a meta-analysis now so you know i think when somebody invented the abacus they probably said that yeah i'm being a bit of a, a machine breaker <laughs> I d yeah I, yeah i wasn't i wasn't sort i was more meaning um i guess as as these tools become more like like the technology itself is obviously really useful, but as you know, like if, if it doesn't come with like really detailed tutorials, which cover the stats side of things as well, um, which fortunately in meta <laughs> and we have, um, yeah, um, it can lead to a, a situation in which people are sort of blindly. Yeah, if you- Probably if you, including if you, myself. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you provided a beautiful tool, that kind of semi-automated it and did it or did everything that we kind of saying, hey, you know, we're not there yet, but maybe we will be in 10 years. If someone naively used it and pressed a button on it, and it's very tick boxy, isn't it? And it does all these things that it does. And it might be very clever and tick boxy, but it's still tick boxy by definition. And sometimes you might want it to tick different boxes and you need to know. You need to have that element of human judgment in there to know that. So yeah, it is a risk, I guess, that that people will do that. But yeah, that 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 misuse of the technology and lack of understanding and not thinking, there are always challenges and problems. I think fundamentally that is the big problem with evidence synthesis, is it's hard and you've got to think, you know, or this stuff about let the data speak for itself. Well, no, you can't. It needs interpreting, you know, so it's hard. No getting away from that. No, I certainly agree. Um, but I, I think that it would be very helpful if we had such a tool, um, because you mentioned about living systematic reviews, so we would need to conduct those literature searches again and again. So if we had a tool that actually did those searches automatically, uh, even if we, you know, uh, gave the, the tool the PICO criteria, patient intervention comparator and outcomes, and then uh, develop potentially the certs. Um, and then the same certs, of course, once a librarian would uh, say that this is appropriate to do, um, and then these certs would automatically be translated to the other databases, I think that would be a huge help as well. But certainly I agree there are risks and we always need to be um, making sure that this is of high quality, whatever is productive, uh, we need to confirm that is of high quality and addresses the question that we want to answer. Yeah, on, on living systematic reviews, I think there was an interesting blog post a few months ago, uh, what's happening when li sy living systematic reviews stopped by Hilda Bastian, um, as sort of a good, yeah. <laughs> Like the ideal of living systematic reviews is uh, is great, but I think I I do yeah I'm not sure I've seen it in let alone in practice like working really well, let alone on rapid, rapidly kind of yeah yeah I think I think I think that's right Matt and I think I think the big issue with rapid reviews is why is it rapid? Why do you need it to be rapid? And it's that thing about, well, there's a policy deadline usually, isn't there? Either 
either it's some kind of a project and it's resource based so it's resource limitations in which case what you're saying is i can get an approximate answer to this question but it's not going to be as reliable as it should be because i don't have time to do it reliably if it's not an important question that's okay if it's an important question that's clearly not a great not a great approach you know, especially thinking about research waste if it's not being driven by that lack of resources then it's being driven by we need to know the answer to this question for some policy deadline uh we you know we're updating the guidelines next year so you know or next week or there's a crisis or whatever it is you've got you've got some kind of immediacy to the problem and then it is about what are the what are the bits that we can miss and most of that is about question setting so it isn't, you know, you might be ditching bits like doing things in duplicate and all the rest of it, but the big savings in systematic review of a, is the question setting. And the bits of systematic review that go wrong most often when you get the futile reviews, just because you've got the question wrong and you've not set it right. So I'm thinking, Matt, about our little rapid review that we did in a couple of days with the PhD students, you know, that looked at flooding and, and trees. On the one hand, that was a lovely little systematic review, but it looked, we picked one outcome that was very easy to measure. And not all what you're interested in when you're looking at flood risk. So it's very nice to produce a little meta analysis and say, well, well, hang on a minute, slow down, folks. You know, the evidence isn't necessarily as, as, uh, as equivocal as everybody says it is. And, and I'm not saying that we haven't made that point, but it is just looking at one outcome that probably isn't the outcome that you're really interested in if you go and ask a load of hydrologists. And so I think that that's the big risk with doing a rapid review is the best way to do a rapid review is to narrow it. You're going to have multiple PICO components are going to be very tightly defined. That's how you can do it quickly. And that carries an inherent risk because if you're looking at the wrong elements, it's not useful. And, and I don't think automation helps with that. I think that's just, that's those value judgments about what, what's the question that we're interested in. And it's probably moving into that dialogue about how does science policy communication go wrong? Because, you know, I'm sure we've all been sat in the room with the people commissioning the review, banging our heads against a wall because they don't actually understand the implications of the decisions that they're making in those kinds of meetings. Absolutely. And if I can also mention here, um, so I believe that if we conduct a rapid review, that could be potentially the basis for the systematic review. So we get the experience um, with all the process and then I believe that the ultimate goal should be always to conduct a systematic review in the end, a high quality systematic review. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That's a really nice idea. You could do it as a rapid review and then you could think about your strength of evidence and you can go, if I turn it from a system, from a rapid review into a systematic review, what's the impact of that going to be on my strength of evidence? And if it's going to change it, then let's do it. And if it isn't going to change it, then let's not bother and leave it as to rapid review and do something else. But then, but then we're going, going back to the idea of a systematic map, essentially. Yeah, so then, yeah. It's, a, <laughs> it's an intermediate step, isn't it? You do yeah. systematic map, rapid review, full review. You'd have to kind of update your protocol 50 million times, but, you know, that's all right. Just thinking about like what what's all done for us um, type of thing. I, th I think a lot of it is that uh, it, it maybe just the small steps that, that are really does speed up. So things like your data visualization, um, the like the, some of the the uh, apps that Neil and I have um, been involved with, and, and Matt um, on sort of trying to speed up citation chasing, making processes easier not necessarily speeding up the actual review part but the other the other ancillary parts that, that go along along with it um like matt you, with your um 
your Revman converter to, to get your data in the right format for it from, um, yeah, Revman or whatever it was, which whatever you wanted, what it was, the oh, oh, yeah, Rayan, um, sorry, Rayan. the Rayan screening yeah. platform, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, so that was, um, so we made a sort of primitive package, Rayan, or um, you help me, um, package it up, uh, switch. Yeah, we had this like sort of non R based platform that was so I think works really well for screening, but then it outputs the data really in a not intuitive, uh, uh, processable format. So we just did some pretty basic passing um, functions on that to yeah get it into a better format, um, which we should probably published somewhere <laughs> because it might be helpful <laughs> before Ray and um, yeah do it themselves because I know they've just had big investment yeah and the synthesis packages as well it's what you know it's worth saying what a massive difference they make I mean if you look at metaphor now you know a few lines of code and bang you're there aren't you you know you're fitting really nice beautiful models um you know, running every different test for publication bias that exists, you know, it's published in stats in medicine. Wolfgang's got it in there six, you know, six weeks later. It's, it's incredible. Or, or if you take, you know, David Filippo's stuff with multi, multi NMA, you know, you're able to do network meta analysis that combines individual patient data with aggregate level data across you know, a network of 15 different treatments. Um, that would have been years of work to, if you were doing that without that software as traditional systematic reviews and doing each of those reviews and all of those analyses and then pulling it all together. You only need to go back a few years before that was, you know, well, a big, a big multi-NMA just by itself. That would, was a lifetime's work. You know, so so it, it is speeding things up. There's no doubt about it. And it's yeah, I do more but, things. Sorry, I think RG wants to come in on that. No, 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 that's okay. You go go ahead, Mark. Yeah, no, um, yeah, I, but again, it's about this distinction between just speeding up systematic reviews, which I sort of agree with. Well, no, I definitely agree with, um, and rapid reviews, which arguably sometimes undermine. The whole idea of systematic review if done in the wrong way. Um, yeah. No, I agree. And um, I, I also was thinking about all these multiple R signing tools that exist for meta analysis, network meta analysis, the meta insights, the cinema to assess the credibility of network meta analysis results. So all these really have speed up the process and save us a lot of time, certainly. We also try to um, present the results of multiple outcomes for the ranking of the different interventions in a ranking plot just to you know, facilitate the interpretation and decision making around that. So I, I, I highly agree all these tools are very important, um, but I think we're not there yet. <laughs> we need, uh, we, we, there are still a lot of tools, I believe, that should be um, uh, produced potentially. Uh, for example, in a network meta analysis, it would be nice to have a tool to, um, once the user uploads the data, to automatically assess the prerequisite assumptions. I know we can do this in NetMeta, in R, using some code, but people, are not all, always familiar with all these codes and with R. So I think if we had an R signing tool that could actually help with those steps um, and also, and the analysis, but also the visualization of the results, um, this would be very, very helpful. Yeah, I'm, I was just thinking if you was gonna, if you're gonna give me a magic bit of software that would mean that I could do a systematic review faster, what, what things, would it do? And I think there's two things that you'd look for, and I'm not sure that AI can help with either of them. The first thing it would make reviewers adhere to methodological expectations and use their brains. <laughs> um, and the second thing is it would make people doing the primary science do decent studies and report them in the right way. They're the two problems. They're the two things that slow you down, aren't they? You know, 
And they're going to be the two things that are problematic for AI to sort out. Because the more straightforward those things are, the easier it is to kind of do systematic review by rote. And the easier you can do a systematic review by rote, the closer it is to a rapid review. Um, so I think that that's the nub of the problem there. So maybe some of this open science stuff and improving standards, maybe that's a prerequisite for having rap automated rapid review. So, you know, thinking about ecology, Matt, if ecologists did have core common outcomes and did report things in a standardised way, then straight away you'd be into kind of robot reviewer territory for doing critical appraisal. At the moment, you just can't do that because the diversity is just too high. So it might be that, you know, this develops in different fields in different ways, but that there's kind of precursors to, um, to really making rapid review and automation of reviews a reality. I mean, I, I think one of the perhaps simpler things, but most useful things it could do is uh, so I'm working on a project uh, where we work with an uh, information specialist to design searches and uh, like good searches and, and run those and get articles and do systematic review meta-analysis. But then you have this thing where you get to the end and, you, and then you, you have to publish it soon, but you have to make sure your um, searches are up to date with six months and then... <laughs> And then you, there's this constant pressure, like in the run up to the deadline. And then, so if it could sort of, I don't know if R can do this, but update those searches um, as the librarian designed them, that's an obvious thing for me. Yeah, even if it, even if it just said, you know, here's a. Here's a little tick box. Here are two new studies that are read that might be relevant. And you have to decide whether they're relevant. It would be really helpful, wouldn't it? Alternatively, you just tell reviewer two to shut up and the strength of evidence is terrible, so it won't make any difference. Well, I mean, we have a conference full of people who, who code in R and a conference full of people, the same conference full of people who, who um, do systematic reviewing. So uh, the whole idea of this conference is really to bring people together. And I, I liked uh, RG talking about what your idea, one of the ideas would be for, for making you know, a package or a shiny app that would actually improve for you, uh, the process or people you work with. So I think it's good to have these ideas because they can easily become future hackathon ideas and we, we can start to think about how to, to do that. Because it's, yeah, the, the type of stuff that, um, people have done in the past and people are doing now is, is to sort of come together in, with experts in, in systematic reviewing and information retrieval uh, and R coders and, and we're, we're making a change. So I think it's, it's really important that we think in those, those terms. And even in, um, in the reporting at the end, of all this process, we need to be very careful and transparent with what we use. Um, so we, as we know, we have those Prisma guidelines for a rapid review. We, we don't have a complete guideline yet. Um, I'm happy to say that we submitted a, a grant to report, I mean, to develop those Prisma um, um, rapid review guidelines uh, with uh, colleagues like uh, Dr. St Stevens, uh, Dr. Moore, um, Dr. Gariti, Trico. We have so many people on the grant. Um, so the aim for this grant is to re reduce, of course, the, the research, minimize the research waste. But um, what I would like to point here is that if we had, again, a tool, <laughs> once those guidelines are available, to uh, help with the reporting um, in, in those uh, manuscripts, I think that would be, again, very helpful. So, yeah, we have a lot to do. I'm, I'm sure we will in the, future, in, the, in the near future, but it's good to have all these ideas in, in this meeting.
Yeah, I reckon that's a bit like Matt's kind of searching bit at the beginning. That bit at the end, I think that's probably more achievable, isn't it? In the in the near term, in the short term, even if you even if you just kind of produced text that was kind of going through Messier and and you and Prisma and kind of saying, where have you got this bit? You know, it's, it, it knows what the effect size is because you've run you've run the forest plot, so it pulls that out. It knows what the heterogeneity is, so it pulls that out and says, don't forget to report the heterogeneity. Is this the heterogeneity you want to report? Um, so it could kind of semi-structure results sections and things like that. The potential for that is high. Yeah. And that's one of the things that Wolfgang was working on in the first, the first ES hackathon we, we did, I think, um, in Stockholm. So one of those, there's automatic reporting of, of um, yeah, what you should report from a meta analysis and that what people never report. So it's, I think it's, those sort of tools are quite um, achievable. Yeah, and, and and like you say, Matt, the kind of the work's been done there. Most communities have got this is what you should report from a meta analysis this is the things that you need to report i think have they we certainly you've got them for social sciences you've got them for medicine with cochrane and campbell you've probably got them for cee have you pretty much ish yeah so you know that's a lot that's a lot of disciplines and domains sorted so those bits are there that's a grant isn't it definitely So, um, do you think that that we can change the definition of a rapid review uh, with the addition of of these R tools or R workflows that we're talking about? Uh, is there is there a time in the future? Oh, the lights have gone off in the office. Uh, is there a time in the future when uh, we can, yeah, make a yeah have this change rapid review? So instead of a, a rapid review, it's just reviews become rapid. So. They're still as robust, but uh, but rapid using, using the tools that we've developed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean we're already on that process, aren't we? If you think if you think about the scale and sophistication of modern systematic reviews, and think back to you know Chalmers or somebody like that sitting there. Or let's go back to Glass sitting there with his psychotherapy. You know, how long did it take him to do that? Whereas now you can do, you would do that same job much faster. I mean, the volume of literature on that topic could be horrendous. But, you know, if you were doing like for like, you'd do it so much faster. The knowledge is there, the tools are there, and they're not going to get worse as we move forward. So, yeah, I think, yeah. It's interesting because what's happening to the volume of primary research is the primary research include improving in evidential value. We've got that problem of the kind of meta mass production, yeah, and lots of really crap systematic review and evidence synthesis. And we want to do away with that. But arguably, we need evidence synthesis more than ever in a post truth world. So doing it efficiently and well and making it fit for purpose so it can answer more complex questions more directly all of those things are kind of in the mix with this aren't they but it's i think that is if you look at the history of systematic review that's what it is it's a history of getting better and faster I certainly agree. I'm only thinking if we need to change the term. So we call it a rapid a rapid review or a rapid systematic review. So far, at least to my knowledge, um, a rapid review is the review with those streamlined processes. So we should not certainly confuse those two types. Um, so certainly we need more uh, time efficient systematic reviews. I think we should still call them systematic reviews if we use those tools. Hopefully they will help us. Of course, we need to 
uh, highlight any risks uh, that we have, as we said. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if we should change the title. <laughs> uh, this is certainly that we need to to discuss. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would completely agree. As people working in systematic review, we know the dangers of proliferation of firms for the same thing. Um, yeah, I, I yeah, I, I kind of feel that yeah, the focus should just be on speeding up systematic review and the creation of this new ill-defined. The <laughs> rapid review kind of undermines that and um, it reinforces criticisms of systematic reviews such as um, it's a made up field um, and they used to just call these literature reviews, which I've heard, you know, recently, like <laughs> the past few months and people trying to squeeze systematic reviews into six months. Like they're not even calling them rapid reviews at this point. <laughs> But I guess, yeah, that's the corollary of that, isn't it? It's, um, I guess, rapid reviews makes it a bit more, seem more palatable, even if it's not, <laughs> or achievable. Yeah, it's buyer beware, isn't it? It can be called a systematic review, and it may or may not be, and it can be called a rapid review, and it may or not be. And, you know one person's rapid review is another person's systematic review and it's all just maybe maybe the uh, the tools and the AI will help us actually define what on earth it is and what it did and what the potential biases are which I guess would go back to what RG was saying about you know is it Amstar compliant and that kind of thing yeah yeah I mean I I, I sense that one of the things hold, holding back uh the speeding up of systematic reviews, perhaps not that they aren't being sped up, is that there's, there's a conversation to be had around what compromises can be made in searching, for example, uh, in screening. Like, I don't know, I don't think, have we really had the conversation about, <laughs> yeah, like, um, to what uh, we probably have, and I probably just ignored it, but <laughs> missed it. But um, I, I, I think there's a tension between. The whole idea of it being systematic and following this um, time-honored protocol and speeding that up. Yeah, and we need the meta epidemiology to guide that, don't we? And and in some fields, that's there, and the open science movement is great for that. You know, I mean, go back five years. How many papers were there about p hacking and harking and? What, 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 what's the average effect size in a field? There was hardly any, you know, I think in ecology, we had Michael Jennings had a kind of, you know, a couple of little stabs at that. And there was a little bit of stuff from Doug Altman in medicine and what have you, but, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't widespread. So that idea of meta epidemiology and meta science more generally, not meaning meta analysis, but, but that understanding the science itself, that'll help a lot. You know, it'd be great, wouldn't it, to know to just have that kind of information. If I search in a non-English language, what what's the probability of me getting extra information? If I miss out these databases, what's it going to do? What's the probability of a risk of bias? If I, you know, if we start assembling that kind of information, this metadata as we're generating our systematic reviews, then we'll have a really rich ecosystem for evidence synthesis. Yeah, I feel like sometimes as a field, we are perhaps a bit afraid of having that conversation in detail because of the fear that it might undermine the field and our jobs. <laughs> yeah, there's some there's some bits of kind of received wisdom that I'm quite happy to do away with, uh, partic particularly on the kind of having every single study component and there's other bits of received wisdom that are kind of absolutely fundamental in one field and ignored in another like critical appraisal where i've got a really strong view that you know everyone should be doing it and there's no exceptions ever um but you know the meta epidemiology to back that position up isn't there it's just it's just what you think isn't it 
and certainly address all these biases, right? So because changing, I mean, the, the number of studies and the studies that we include in every review um, potentially include in increases <laughs> biases as well, right? So the quality again, again, I will highlight the quality of the review is important. Yeah, your mistakes can be illuminating like that, can't they? I, I, I did one review where I got my treatment and control mixed up the wrong way around. So my effect size was in the opposite direction, for example. And, you know, I'd say that was a perfectly good systematic review. Um, it wasn't done, the data extraction wasn't done in duplicate. So I, maybe if it had been, then that mistake wouldn't have been made. But if it hadn't been a systematic review, there wouldn't have been study characteristics tables that let other people go, Gav, you've made a mistake, you create Muppet. Uh, and then people published a load of papers saying you made a mistake, it completely invalidates your results and you're talking rubbish. And it doesn't make the slightest bit of difference either to any of the heterogeneity or to, <laughs> or to the pooled effect. You know, okay, the confidence intervals will probably have been a tiny bit wider. Uh, <laughs> big deal you know so sometimes you can make these shortcuts you can miss studies you can make mistakes it doesn't matter and other times it could have a devastating effect and you just the trouble is knowing when it is and when it isn't no absolutely and particularly when we have only a few number of studies in the analysis that's a really huge issue and hopefully those tools will help us avoid some of these mistakes <laughs> if, of course, are um, developed for data abstraction, for example. Because we, at least in my experience, we always have data abstraction errors. We always have to go back to the papers and see, or we have to contact the authors, is this what you re report here? Um, standard errors are often misinterpreted as standard deviations and, so, and vice versa. So things like this, um, are very important in, in any type of review, even rapid or systematic review. Yeah, and 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 also the value judgments and the arguments. You know, it can take. If you want to, you know, if you've got a complicated study and you try to figure out how you should generate the effect and which of the confounders and all the rest of it, you know, you can you could have a massive debate, and in fact, a whole field could have a massive debate about that for quite a long time before it came to a collective judgment. Um, so yeah, the value judgments as well that are in there are always open to question, aren't they? I think that, I mean, what we'd be basically saying is that the things that, that R can do is, is speed up those small things at the moment and in the future can speed up some of the bigger things. There's always gonna be a need for a human oversight uh, there's always going to need someone particularly for the sort of more in-depth parts of the process um, the critical appraisal perhaps is, is one bit that, that an R package might not be able to do very well um, by itself um, and I think one of the things we probably haven't mentioned enough is that that uh, this having uh, R code open and available um, allows people to, to look at your code and see what you're doing so the uh, Matt you mentioned before about uh, sort of yeah, the ease of doing some of these these tools isn't necessarily good because a lot of people would just do them and run them and without thinking about them, um, just run a meta-analysis and, and don't really know what they're doing and, and why they're putting data in the right places. But at least with our code that is open and shared, we can, someone can go and have a look at that code and rerun it and say, well, hang on a second. As, as Gav found out with his paper, did, hang on a second, something's gone wrong there. So we can, um, yeah, have a look again and, and try it again. So I think that, uh, R combined with open science uh, will speed up normal reviews, uh, but then there's also this question of, of what a rapid review is, or an ultra fast review, or a super duper speedy review, all those things that we we yeah don't really know what they are yet. So we've got one minute left. Uh, I don't know if anyone's got any any final thoughts. Yeah, just on that point, I I think there's a lot of this links into sort of more general conversations about like in open science about sort of like version controlled publishing and iterative, like, cause often what is holding us back is like this goal towards this perfect end product. And especially when you work on a systematic review and you're dealing with other people's data and loads of it. Um, 
that's that can be a anxiety inducing thing which holds you back yeah i mean so like e-life's new model although it's controversial is sort of moving toward that concept yeah or the idea that argy was talking about where you kind of sit it between a systematic map and a and a full systematic review and then you have you know a systematic review and then someone comes along and adds another population to it or adds another outcome to it and into that kind of whole living systematic review type idea yeah yeah i might much prefer that sort of like a the idea of this automated living systematic review which updates itself like being able to sort of chip in on other people's research and you know tag tag in tag out yeah yeah, people have talked about that as an alternative to peer review as well, haven't they? Which is interesting in the context of critical appraisal. That, you know, if 556 people have all worked on it and looked at it and they're happy with it, it's telling you something about its validity. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, slow, iterative, so put the way. Okay, uh, I'm going you know, to call it a day there uh, so thank you all for, for joining us and and thank you everyone up for, for watching uh, yes and i hope you enjoy the rest of the conference